Mm. Hey, it's Chris. Hey. We're back. Adrian, hello. Jeremiah, hello. hello. What an introduction. That was the shortest introduction hello. ever. Um, <laughs> We're back. We're here. We want to talk. Okay, go. We want to talk. Uh, Jeremiah, as promised, is in his echo chamber now. Say something. I am. Hello. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> you can hear it. <clears throat> echo, echo, echo. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah. What is on the list today? On you want to talk today? On tap today, we're going to talk about photographers' <clears throat> uh, subject of dramatic films. That's and, the, and and of course, of course, the the film guy in the round is the one who suggested <laughs> that. And I've just looked in the notes, and the the, the list of movies that Jeremiah put in there is o overwhelming for me because I didn't have quite as many. So. Let's there are a lot more <laughs> movies about <laughs> photographers that I have um, overlooked, I'm sure, uh, through uh, just fault of my own memory or uh, that I haven't seen. Also, uh, you know, f movies about photography are like movies about hackers. <laughs> or oh, very, very true. Very true. Like, yes. And so you're always somewhat on the outside of it and, and getting into the internal stuff is, is not easy, um, though some uh, have fared better than others. Um, you know, certainly, you know, when we look at uh, classic English, odd, perverse movies like Peeping Tom, uh, later Hitchcock's Rear Window, mm -hmm. um, there, there, there are movies that really do inhabit the sensibility of, of, of photographers. And, and I'm going to talk about, uh, personally, two, two movies that I brought. One that does get into the kind of internal dynamics of a photographer's world, and one that significantly does not, but has fantastic imagery associated with it. Uh, one is a, a serious uh, semi-biopic, uh, and the other, a total absurdist <laughs> view of the world of fashion <laughs> photography in the 70s in New York. So um, I'm going to kick this off with a recent film that I do highly recommend. Um, it's it's a, a film called Minimata. Uh, it was made, I guess, the year before last, and, and um, it stars... Uh, a almost minimata um, how do you spell that min m i n a i think minamata minamata uh, 2020 japanese yes uh, uh, almost a a um, unrecognizable johnny depp playing w eugene smith who was an unbelievable great uh reportage photographer who who inhabited a, a, a strong sense of, of what is right and wrong in terms of uh, his pursuit of um, unveiling the truth about uh, corporate pollution in a community and really did uh, contribute to the change thereof. And uh, his performance, along with uh, uh, Hiroyuki Sanada, another amazing actor, um, is, is a, a, a very um, powerful look under the fingernails of a photographer, the, 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 um, that's Hero. Um, and I, I just say this because I know both of these actors and they give tremendous performances. And, and also the, the pressures that uh, publishers, in this case, Life Magazine, uh, where uh, Gene Smith worked, um, and, and their, the pressure on bringing the story um, and the expense and all the rest of it that, that a reportage photographer um, is, is kind of under. Um, so, you know, it's in black and white. Um, it's, it's beautifully, beautifully uh, photographed, you know, just the, the film itself, and does capture um, a passion um, and difficulty um, of how a photographer work works under really uh, brutal circumstances. So, and, and some of the movies on my list are, are like that. So Minamata, is, is, a, is, is that a movie that you would um, uh, completely agree with as a photographer 
as opposed to some that are probably more cringeworthy? No, th this is uh, the reason I, I, I kind of presented this as, as a movie. A, it's, it's recent, so it's just been released or will be released very, very soon. So that's, uh, that's kind it. of a, that's kind uh, of the real deal. <clears throat> it's the real deal, and and I do think at least it creates the illusion for me um, of of how how a photographer works, uh, the kind of ins and outs of it, the the obstacles that one has to overcome, <clears throat> and and how setting up reportage photographer photography is sometimes a combination of just getting close i think it was kappa who said that if your photographs are not good you're just not close enough and and so here's a question um do you know if johnny depp is a photographer himself um like i i, I know i know there are, there are several well-known <laughs> actors um who yeah. are photographers Jeff as well. Sure. Jeff Bridges, Len Leonard Nimoy was a very good photographer, yeah. um, and several others. Uh, do you Neil know Brenner, Jeff? apparently, as well, always used to have a, a Leica with him and take you know, shots around the film sets and things and, like that. Uh, probably and go you've, back a bit now. <laughs> and you, Jeremiah, have worked with, with Johnny Depp, so is do you know if he's a, a, a no, photo nerd? I never had a, a recollection of him, of, okay. of him taking pictures, though I would, I would imagine that after doing Minamata, he would definitely have sublimated to it and got mm -hmm. addicted to it. Um, the, the images and how some of, I don't know if, if our listeners are familiar with the work of W. Eugene Smith, but they are well worth looking at. Um, I, I, the record, I think he was close to uh, getting a, a Pulitzer if it, maybe he didn't get one, but um, his work is, is very very powerful. Uh, you know, he's a, a you know a, a war photographer and a, a uh, someone who really really was very passionate about social injustice. And you can see how um, sometimes his work is is that here's uh, how how his work is sometimes just by nature of being close and being there, he was able to capture the images. And sometimes his uh, ability to kind of uh, ingratiate himself into the communities he was photographing and, and, and allow or, or create the, the, the permission to get him to be able to photograph uh, very, very difficult Uh, relationships, uh, in this case, with children who've been effectively poisoned, and with their parents, and, and how difficult, and but and, and how embarrassed they often were about being photographed and published. And so establishing the trust was something that was um, um, a, a very significant part of his process. Um, spending time. And so th there's a lot to learn in this movie. I mean, it's very entertaining, obviously, and, and beautifully rendered uh, in terms of the relationships and the acting. Um, well photographed, as I mentioned, to capture the feeling of his photographs. But I think most, most important for those uh, photographers who aspire to that... Um, You know, James Natchway is, is a great example of someone who's working in that <clears throat> realm and, and moving as close as he can be to communities under stress and being involved in that and, and, and having them allow him to take pictures. And then um, we can learn a lot from these photographers. It's not just a question of strapping on a telephoto and uh, being in your you know, safe zone and photographing images, however good or, or kind of mediocre or even fantastic they will be. But it is the interpersonal that creates the um, majesty of these powerful, powerful images. And so for those of us who, who have been interested in that, um, there are a lot of lessons to learn Uh, in terms of what it takes to be a photographer. It's not just having a camera, it's having the social grace, trust, intention, 
and ability to communicate to one's um, potential communities that then allows the eye to open up and have that interactive experience. So um, it's something that I really think is um, well worth watching for those reasons. So um, I'll throw one in here, which is sure. adjacent to photography. And it's one of those where you go, yeah, no, oh, maybe not. <laughs> um, but it, it's a film that, that it stuck with me. And it's The Secret Life of Walter Mitty from 2013. Mm. Uh, ben Stiller. I'm, I'm not really into his movies usually, <laughs> like some of my style, but that one was very different. And it uh, it shows Walter Mitty, who's a... I think he works at a, at, a, at a picture desk at a newspaper. And uh, so he's always, he always sees this photography in front of his eye and, and, and he goes on this journey to find the photographer. Um, so it's, it's a really just a photography adjacent movie, but I think it's a really great device to make him go on that journey. And that is, uh, is what kind of the, the whole travel and journey aspect. Uh, I really liked, I really enjoyed yeah i think it's a terrific movie uh, personally um and and um it's fair you know it, it is very much um i wouldn't consider it adjacent i i, I think it has a, a a you know obviously a very surreal oh yes uh, content <laughs> content it's very very enga engaging <laughs> as one could see from the trailers um but it's it, often it's on many many lists um, of best uh, films about photography. And there's like oh yeah, and he's he's with he's with life life. Uh, that's yeah. where he works. So it's a it's a it's a <laughs> yeah. I'm 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 a I'm a great fan of it. Really, really uh, stuck with me. You know, uh, we should probably just take a, a side um, sidebar because uh, both the movies that we've mentioned um, are are centered in a way, at Life Magazine. And, and I know for myself, um, Life Magazine, which no longer really exists in, in any kind of uh, form, was a large format magazine. In other words, it was um, not, uh, it was big. Um, and it was very, very focused on great reportage imagery. It had um, tremendous uh impact on me growing up. I, I devoured every issue growing up. And I think its impact on defining my relationship to photography um, uh, was critical in, in so many ways. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in some ways I mourn its loss because the the care and, and um, passion of the editors themselves, which is uh, presented somewhat in in Minamata, the stresses of selling your magazine week by week, what constitutes a you know a kind of a pop piece as opposed to a informative uh, progressive uh, reportage that's critical to change policies. That's always in balance, and and um, Life magazine really uh, you know, they join forces with Time. Later on, Time Life, yeah. uh, then gobbled up by Warners, etc. Um, but it's not the same thing as seeing images on a screen. There's something uh, quite palpable about holding a large magazine, turning pages of, of a kind of a, a comprehensive folio where you really can feel the photograph in your in your hand, spend time with it. Um, and um, so I, I think that that we have to kind of give a shout out to Life Magazine um, just as a sidebar for these movies too. Yeah, it's a shame stuff like that is is gone, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, there's there's a magazine in, in the UK. It's one of the last. Uh, uh, I suppose there's, there's still a few print magazines around photography, but of course most of them are around cameras and and things like that rather than the, the telling stories and using photography as a, as a method to communicate. But there's a there's a there's a magazine called Black and White Photography. It's just that it's just called Black and White Photography, yeah. uh, which uh, does occasionally carry actual story features, 
uh, where the photography is, you know, it, it is the story, as it were. Not not quite in the same way that Life magazine uh, will have done. But, uh, yeah, it's... it's uh, hmm. It'd be nice to get so, some of that back. <laughs> yeah, several of the, of the films on that list um, really come out of the, the you know, photojournalist um, relevance uh, at some point at some time. And I think it's, it's more difficult for the Kappas and the Natchways at this moment to reach a big audience. And, and may, maybe the photojournalist is, is easier to, to, to bring to a wider audience than someone who spends day and night in his studio tinkering with tabletop stuff and so on. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. It's a bit more exciting, you know. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Yeah, it's dangerous too. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I have, you know, at one point I was at a, a bit of a crossroads in terms of where I wanted to go with my photography, and I've always been like, like you, Chris, a, a, a global traveler, and have gone very far afield in often in war zones and often in very chaotic environments, and and use the camera in in many ways as a shield, um, which worked. Um, and, and did get, quote, permission from people who would <laughs> normally fucking kill me. Um, and, and uh, you know, come back with images that are striking, um, you know, or, or just being in uh, a place at a, a kind of a pivotal time. I mean, I was in New York walking across the bridge Uh, Williamsburg Bridge during 9/11, as the plane, as the they were coming down, and and experienced 9/11 in my own uh, individual way, seeing it uneditorialized, you know, in real life, um, without any framing device, just observing it without any information, and and and, and I did take a lot of pictures, um, which I hardly even remember being conscious enough to take these pictures because we were all in shock. I was a very close friend. And and I, even to this day, I find it very hard to go through. I have not printed a lot of them. I, I find it very, very hard um, to look at them um, because it just kind of captures my emotional state at that time. At some point, I will. Um, and that's why, I, in, in many ways, I applaud those really bold Uh, war photographers who are able to get these images that in some ways, you know, changed the world. I mean, the, the image of, of um, in the Vietnam image of, of the girl running down, naked girl, run, little girl running down the highway. Uh, after, and we all are so familiar with that. Um, and, and that is an image that um, in many ways did change um, American focus on the war and certainly on those who are not opposed to the war. now in in that context in the context of war photography here's another one that really impressed me and that is it's it's it's, it's a bit on the documentary side but it's war photographer about uh, james mm -hmm. natwai who yeah. um who they follow around and uh and look him over the shoulder at what he does while he goes to uh places and It's yeah. it's one of those very intense kind of documentaries. So not not for the squeamish, but certainly uh, something that leaves a lasting impression on what that not just what what he's like and what he does, but what war does to photographers. I mean, this is one of yeah. the big parts of that. What I, what what it leaves uh, behind in the photographers. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 I mean, even though we're here to talk about dramatic films. Yeah, so, uh, sort of us sneaking that one in. I can't, no, 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 but I cannot recommend this movie enough. This is, uh, for, I, I personally, I have all, all of his published works, his big, big books, War Photographers especially. Uh, I, I find him to be one of the great uh, photojournalists of all time, never mind, um, you know, present day uh, but his work is is often so difficult to look at 
but so powerful a record of man's inhumanity to man um, and um, his his incredible uh, bravery um, and and compassion is and, and the, very significant. And the way at the same time uh, he, he seems to manage to distance himself from some of these things in a way that others don't seem to be able to. So it's a really good yeah. portrait, I think. Very, very... Very, and 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 his photography. There's there's this intersection of his photography between, well, between show, showing the gruesome reality of war and make doing it in an artistic fashion, which is yeah, which which is something. Re well, is really something. Yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty much the best word I can find for it. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a direct connection between him and W. Eugene Smith. They, yeah. they are of of an ilk where the photographs that they took are aesthetically beautiful of grim history, if you can kind of parse those together, I guess. Okay, how do we get out of the grimness? Uh, any suggestions well. from you, Adrian? <laughs> Well, I mean, I could mention, uh, you know, Jimmy, the photographer in the Superman movies. I, I could have mentioned, of course, <laughs> I could, of course, mention Peter Parker. Uh, you know, so, so the, the, these are these are some of the movie fictional movie photographers that I've grown up with. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because we, we we set ourselves the chance, the the, the task of talking about you know uh m m fictional movies uh, about photographers and i find i i've um watched very few actually of the list that jeremiah's given us i know i've watched one hour photo i know i've watched carol um but you know uh yeah i have never watched rear window um which i'm sure there will be listeners out there who might who will be saying Shame. you Shame. yeah yeah you should go and watch that you really should go and watch that so uh it's it's an interesting one isn't it i think um i've 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 got one i found one that i i actually do want to watch um uh which is a film called proof which was made in i think 1991 um and uh stars russell crowe and hugo weaving um uh, i i do I do like some of Russell Crowe's earlier movies. In fact, actually, you know, uh, generally speaking, I think some of the some of the some of the Australian actors who who've made it big over the years, and I, I, and two two just to name them would be Mel Gibson and Russell Crowe. Um, I find some of their earlier movies made in Australia to be the more compelling stuff, to be honest. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to watch that because yeah, I, I'm going to watch that, and that's going to be the thing that I set myself to do because uh, you know the, this um, uh, it's 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 good to see it's good to see some of these established names when, when yeah in their younger years, but it's also you know the, this is clearly not a you know, a Hollywood movie, so uh, so we'll see we'll see what we learn yeah. from all of that. I mean, uh, the year of living dangerously is is an interesting movie of this kind of realm and ilk, um, you know, uh, that was a good balance between kind of social... That's even earlier. That's from early 80s. Yeah. Yeah, very uh, strong, strong movie. Um, beautifully done. Yeah, I, I, I find I have watched more stuff that is that is more sort of either documentary, uh, you know, or... Um, less less or, or you know biographical let's say you know non-fictional biographical stuff uh, about photographers and even actually you know in these enlightened times when we all have a video platforms aplenty and everybody self-publishes there's actually quite a lot of good stuff out there um, in my studies of photography about your sort of learning approach and learning technique and things like that from people who's who's um uh, whose photography I, I appreciate, um, and I, you know, one of the things um, that made a, a reasonably big impression on me is actually a few years back now. But there's a photographer called Gregory Heisler, mm -hmm. and I really do like the portraiture that he makes. Um, and and there's some stuff yeah you know, that he's done on YouTube, uh, which is yeah you know, all all about you know the the work that he's done and things like that so i i find myself more drawn to to that and yeah as opposed to fictional movies about photographers but it's never occurred to me to to watch fictional movies about photographers before 
<laughs> well, well if, you, if, if you look in the show notes, there's an entire list of recommendations there. So. <laughs> That's right. Uh, um, uh, uh, switching gears, I thought from the you know sublime to the ridiculous, I'm, I'm going to recommend, just because it's so absurd, um, a movie called The Eyes of Laura Mars. This is 1978, New York City. It was uh, directed by Erin Kirshner, uh, who's passed away recently, and, and um, stars Faye Dunaway and Tommy Lee Jones. Um, it was written by John Carpenter, something that people may or may not know. The images in the movie were done by Helmut Newton, and it is a, a complete... Um, bizarre uh, plotted movie um, about a fashion photographer uh, in, in New York City 70s. Um, I don't think you could make this movie today, certainly with with the uh, critique of the male gaze and 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 the the kind of images of Newton, which are kind of, uh, these are the tame ones, but all about women. This, this is IMDb, murder. so I don't think they have the real... <laughs> right. <They're, laughs> you know, so, <clears throat> but, but um, what's captivating about this is it's done, it, it's shot in that kind of neo-gritty New York realism on the street, and yet the photography is ultra glossy slick. So there's that <laughs> dynamic. And and so there is a, a real, uh, I mean, it, it is an absurdist, completely crazy film. And it really is about a photographer who has visions. Her visions, of course, are applied to her images but they tend to come true in the murder of all those around her uh. never quite explain <laughs> though why or how <laughs> it's, so, it's movie logic it's movie logic you know? yeah i don't I, I don't think it was a massive hit at the time um you know barbara streisand sings the theme song uh, pretty effectively um but but I think the interesting thing that it was written by John Carpenter, and I only could imagine that he probably wrote it to shoot it himself and at the time hadn't, hadn't done enough or, or else he pulled it out of his drawer and sold it. Maybe if he's listening, he can check it out and tell me, <laughs> but, but um, the, the, the approach to, because I was a fashion photographer at that time. So I went to see it just because I could eat popcorn and go, ha, ha, that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and, and, and just in terms of the, you know, the productions of these fashion shoots. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of models and a lot of like uh, kind of very, uh, what one could say in, in the, the scenes where Faye Dunaway as this kind of very famous photographers having shows and whatnot, but when she's talking to the hairdressers and the models about fuller lips, please, or cover this eye. Yeah, I saw it. I mean, it just, everything is so on the money. I mean, it, it just feels like it's of the mint, never mind on the money. It's just so obvious. Uh, but for those of of you guys who want a lighthearted, crazy period piece that also is fascinated in that when you look at New York City uh, of that moment, it, it, it is so, it's New York in its most kind of gritty, you know, and, and uh, so there's the fascination of the street shooting and all the rest of that, that, that is equally fascinating to the slickness. So um, don't hate me for recommending it. I recommend it as the opposite of Minamata. Watch, watch it at your own peril. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, Interesting stuff. That's, Interesting that's my stuff. Second recommendation. I did. I have to say, just another slight aside. Actually, um, you know, the, there are m movies that include the, or the, the <laughs> include as part of their scenery the the grittier side of New York. Um, do, do intrigue me because, of course, uh, I you know, not not uh, only having ever been to New York 
two to, to, two or three times ever in my life and and all of that in in much more modern times since it's all been cleaned up and regenerated and stuff like that you know when you uh watch films like uh i don't know, like midnight cowboy for example that's pretty that's got some pretty gritty sides of new york in it hasn't it sure. um, yeah so it's uh it, it is a it, it's it's an odd thing you know and i have a, a, a an american colleague who said yeah her, her parents used to live there and then they moved away and they came back and they said no we don't like it anymore it's too safe in new york now <laughs> it's just like... I, I i agree um having lived in new york um often i'm like you know adult life um new york at that time was, was really gritty and and you know garbage strewn and uh, you know subway trains were painted uh, you know it was and yet one could find a cheap apartment. There were communities of people not earning a huge amount of money. You could walk from the Battery to Fort Tryon, the whole length of Manhattan. And each time, you know, each 10, 20 blocks, you would come into a different language, community, culture, food, you know. And so it was really, it felt like the universe in one island. And and uh, you didn't have to be ultra wealthy to enjoy all of the benefits of, of a great city. Um, you know, I, I would imagine Berlin was very much like that uh, uh, as well at some point where, where communities of wealth and 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 and, and let's call it poverty or lower middle class, whatever you want to call it, still had room to breathe and, 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 and work together and, and celebrate just being together. Um, New York is not that anymore. I mean, they're, you know, to buy an apartment in New York is absurd. And, you know, you see every week apartments going for 150 million, 200 million. I mean, that's, that's a lot complete. of money. That makes London less yeah, affordable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, just crazy. And so, uh, you know, Giuliani came in and, and really cleaned it up. And I think he made it more like Toronto. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> Maybe but, that's but, why they uh, shoot all those mo- movies in Toronto these days. <laughs> for New York, you yeah. know, no, 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 no hit on Toronto. It's just a different city than New York was. But, you know, New York still has its advantages, but is no longer the kind of what I considered that kind of urban vibe that uh, that I miss you know I'm, I miss the the energy of it at that point yeah I was there in 1988 for the first time and it was very different yeah. from now very different yeah. and even then it was pretty cleaned up yeah, <laughs> yeah. all I was right living in New York in 88 there yeah. ah, there you go we could have we, we might have met no it wasn't no I had just no, I had an apartment there but I was living in LA at the time yeah, All right. Whatever. Who can remember? Okay. So anyone uh, who wants to uh, watch <laughs> photographer-related movies, then uh, go to the show notes. You got a list. Be an entire yep, list, nice list in yeah. there. Um, yeah. Let's move on to the picks of the week. Let's uh, kick this off with Jeremiah's pick, which is no, no, no. Wait. Let's just put this at the end because yeah, it is really nice and visual. Um, I just wanted to bring up the James Webb telescope again the most amazing camera on this planet well, several cameras don't because, think it's on the planet anymore chris well just, it, it was just it was to be picky it was on the planet okay <laughs> the formerly known as no Sorry. it's it's almost where it needs to be and uh the thing that i find amazing is that they have actually managed to not just get it there but to get it to the point where it can function because they had i've look i've looked it up they had 344 single points of failure which means 344 wow. things that had to go right critical things that had to go right for it to work and that includes all the different things like uh, unfolding the 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 heat shield unfolding the 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 tripod that the secondary mirror sits on, which is one of the most amazing tripods on <laughs> that, that we've ever built. Um, the the of course the big mirrors, the everything, lots of things that could have gone wrong and that didn't. And now it's out there with a whole bunch of different cameras on board. Not cameras in the traditional sense, but cameras that are gonna look into the into the well very close to the Big Bang in the infrared spectrum. So they have, that's but one of the reasons why those mirrors, those big mirrors are gold or gold 
uh, plated because that is better for infrared uh, radiation. So it looks cool as well, and, and it looks oh, yeah. very cool. <laughs> and uh, it is another. Well, let's see, days. It's another four or five as the time of this recording. Four or five days to make it to the L to Lagrange point insertion where its new home will be. So. Um, That's yeah, really I argue cool. this is. Well, I could argue this is one of the most uh, sophisticated and amazing tools that humanity has ever built. Very true, very true. And interestingly enough, you hear questions now from some of the journalists going, "Yeah, but what's the big deal? Nothing bad happened. It's out there. It works. Wasn't that expected?" <laughs> it's like not really getting the 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 no. magnitude of this thing that took almost 20 years to build and to test and to test yeah. again and to test more and <sighs> maybe they'll make a fictional movie about the building of that then that was about yeah that, <laughs> at some point i just suppose if, if everything goes right there's going to be little little tension in the fictional movie they, they'll have to invent some political tension or something like that won't they <laughs> They will. They will. You mean sure. when they when they ask for another ten billion dollars because they're over budget? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yes. Okay. <laughs> something, well, something we've already like spent ten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Adrian, how money. about your pick? Okay, so well, uh, my pick uh, this week is uh, just a bit of fun. So uh, I and uh, I, I don't print uh, enough of my photographs i mean I, I do as as i'm sure i've said many times on this podcast i do love my little six by four dye sublimation printer and i print stuff out fairly regularly but they just sort of sit around in piles so today i today so this week uh i made myself a little photo book and uh i really like it so some of the, some of the stuff i've been out shooting the last few months uh with my little pocket is it you in here no that's that's, a, that's an example that, no this is at. this is not me no this is just the advertising page ah, so it which which to be honest it 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 could be any it could be any consumer grade printing service this one happens to be snapfish um it, it i only chose it because that you know it, it was the first one i found that had a, a sort of zine type product that we, you could order one of um and i just wanted to throw some photos in. well not throw some photos in it but get some photos in it so yeah it, into a book so yeah it's part of you know i i just just a bit of fun just for the new printing some stuff out for the from the last few months in a little book little collection of stuff uh and uh yeah that was that was my tip of the week the old pick of the week this week um cheap cheap and cheerful photo books that can print be a bit more, of fun print more photos yeah i think we can all agree on that I'm good with that yeah all right jeremiah your pick um is a series i picked I picked a television series, a short-lived one, uh, but one that is uh, possibly really interesting to photographers, uh, just because uh, I, I believe the the pilot was done by Mark Romanek, who's a wonderful visualist. Number two, it's based on a series of hyper-realistic paintings by Simon Selhag. Um, and I just became aware of his work um, many, you know, several years ago and, and had collected his artwork um, just, I mean, not f just in books, uh, just thought it was really evocative, beautiful, not really a story, but I, I just loved it so much. Then I heard that um, someone had acquired them to make a film of it or a series and they made a 10 episode series. It's very slow moving. Um, and they kind of strung together um, the plot, but visually um, it is a stunning uh, piece that pays tribute to uh, an artist who is, I think, significantly overlooked. Um, and I, I recommend it. Um, and I think they only did one season. Um, but there you go. Yeah, I, sometimes I, it's good to stop while you're winning. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed him. I noticed him years ago, and I have all his books. And he's uh, he's a, he's a wonderful artist. It's just yeah, as you said, like amazing stuff, really amazing stuff. Yeah. 
So it's just you could read in your story, like when you turn the pages of those books, the paintings that he did. You could project your own stories on it's it. Like, I mean, it's just a fact. It's like it's like a, a, a parallel timeline of your own youth. Yeah, isn't it? There's a lot of magic in it. Um, there's hope in it. There's dystopia in it. Yeah. Um, there's you know relationships with a parent in it. Um, there's gorgeous landscapes in it. Um, And uh, the fact that they, they kind of went there and made this is, um, I guess, a tribute to that. Yes. But it, I think it was too slow and non-dramatic for a general audience to kind of dip into. But it is a beautiful piece. We should, we should show these people a Tarkovsky movie, and then we talk about slow. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, could, we could do a, a Tarkovsky, by the way, Tarkovsky uh, episode just grabbing our favorite stills um, oh yes oh yes you know, i'm you know I'm that's that's one fan. that's one for for one of the future episodes this yeah. was episode 210 of the future of photography thanks for uh, listening thanks for watching if you're on youtube leave us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe we'll be back soon with more until then everyone take care and bye-bye bye bye, bye.